Welcome back, everyone. This is our uh, second uh, live of the day. And for supporters, we'll see you at 7 o'clock tonight for, uh, you know, grab your pen and pencil and get along for a uh, busy train ride tonight, boy. Okay, so for uh, those of you who may be joining us from Kin and Kind's uh, site and are not already fans of Judy Morgan DBM, uh, quick overview, I have been practicing medicine, veterinary medicine for 36 years. And uh, I have two integrated practices in Southern New Jersey, which means that we practice both holistic and traditional uh, medicine. We have some clients who are all holistic. We have some clients who are uh, very traditional. Most of our clients do a combination of the two and we find that works out really well because we have more tools in our toolbox. And um, on the banner of my page, there's all kinds of awards that I've won because you know I, 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 I somehow somebody told me, you know, that person with the most trophies, awards, and initials behind their name wins. I don't know. I don't know what I win, but anyway. So today I have a special guest uh, from Kin and Kind, and it's Dr. Mark Balatudo. And Mark, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and give us a little yeah. background. Thank you very much, Dr. Judy. You definitely win with all of those wonderful <laughs> accolades and, and uh, letters behind your name. But yes, I'm Mark Balatudo. I am the lead veterinarian for research and development at Kin and Kind. Um, I've actually been practicing for about 15 years now with a lot of the work that I've been doing is on wild animals and always looking at the natural best method for caring for animals in the wild and also your pets. So yeah, I'm really excited to be here, especially today because with Jesse talking about itchy animals. <laughs> Itchy animals, and I will tell you, I do consultations for people all over the world, and itchy animals are right up there at the top. It's really a combination of inflammatory bowel disease and itchy animals, and really, we know that because the gut is such an important part of the immune system, that the two really go hand in hand. Um, so, uh, I, and I'm shocked to hear that you have been in practice for 15 years because you look so young. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I graduated from Penn in 2006, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful roller coaster. That's amazing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, tell us about your friend there. He's adorable. Oh, this is Jessie. She is my COVID puppy. So <clears throat> we wound up getting her just a, a couple months ago. Oh, she was born a couple months ago, actually. And I picked her up three weeks ago. So she's a, a wonderful reverse brindle boxer. That's what the, the color scheme is. But she actually looks black and white, almost like a, a large Boston Terrier. We love her so much. Right, Jesse? Jesse Norman is her full name. She's named after an opera singer. She's and, very cute. Yeah. And she also has itchy problems. Already? <laughs> Already. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to take care of this the best way. Right? Yeah. Thank you. All right, so that I, I'm going to go out of order here, but you know, you've got a puppy and she's already itchy. So, yeah. what are you feeding this little one? <laughs> you know, <laughs> because everybody that follows me knows that it's all about the food. <laughs> yeah, so she actually gets a, she she's only actually itchy in her ears. So thankfully, it's not generalized throughout her skin. But we're feeding her some Purina Pub pellets, but a mixture with natural food, and she she does great with it. But the real reason why, I know the reason why she's got itchy ears is because it's a little wet in there. <laughs> and I have not actually gotten in there to start cleaning it yet. And shame on me. So. <laughs> what about yeah. Well, especially since Kin and Kind makes such a, a wonderful ear yeah. product. <laughs> exactly. I have to get on it. I keep telling my partner, I have to go down and get some Kin and Kind products for her. <laughs> you think <laughs> So, so, but you're absolutely right. Moisture in the ears is a problem. So we want to use some sort of a drying agent. And one of the problems that I see with a lot of products on the market is their first ingredient is water right. or they have alcohol. Alcohol is a wonderful drying agent, but if you have an animal with ulcerated, red, irritated ears, just think what it feels like when you have a cut and you put alcohol on it, you want to die. And, you know, then people wonder why their animals won't let them treat their ears, why they're trying to bite at them when they're trying to do something with their ears. So that's what I love about the Kid and Kind product because witch hazel is in it, which is a nice drying agent. And then it's got the aloe, which is soothing. Exactly. And then we've got tea tree, which is antibacterial and antifungal. So what a 
perfect combination. Um, so I'm sure once you start treating that that little one, your problem yeah. will be solved. But, it's gonna go right away, and it'll smell great too. <laughs> it does, and I will admit that veterinarians' children, our four four legged children. Generally, you're the last ones to get any attention. <laughs> always, always. And you know something, just like everyone else, I get a little worried with my pets too, even though I know the answer. I know what I should be doing. But uh, yeah, they're my babies. Of course, yeah. I'm gonna get a little worried. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, somebody made a, uh, uh, Nanette Roberts said, my Lukey's the same way. His left is the worst side. And I'm going to give everybody a little Chinese medicine here. The left side is the yin side. The yin side is moisture, dampness, dark, and that's why we get more ear infections on the left. It's the yin side, it attracts the moisture, it holds the moisture, and a dark, moist place is the perfect place for yeast and bacteria to grow. So that's why mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, it's gonna be the left ear if you only have one. That, that's actually very, very interesting you say that. So I, I just spent the last year and a half working in China, working specifically on giant pandas. Oh, that's so cool. And we do apply a lot of Chinese traditional medicine standards on the pandas. And so uh, that is something that the veterinarians that I work with out there that I'm training always say is the yin side. So most likely things are going to start happening on the left. But yep. as always, we're trying to treat things uh, conservatively, try not to gouge them with tons of medicine. Right. And um, the pandas are better for it. Yep, absolutely. So, I mean, this, this goes across uh, all species, really. It's, right. it's not just a dog thing or a cat thing or, or even a panda or even an animal thing. Uh, <laughs> so in my course that we're going to do tonight, we're, everything that we talk about is going to apply to you as the owner as well as to your pets. So, uh, so we use food therapy for ourselves as well. Um, so uh, let's talk about, Mark, uh, some of the signs and causes for uh, skin irritation. Um, I mean, yeah. I know you, you've done a lot with wildlife, but I know that you probably get a lot of questions through Kin and Kind, and I know that Janine spends a lot of time trying to help people out uh, with problems as well. So would you like to touch on that real quick? Yeah. So um, uh, just to remind my practice is, is I've done a lot of dog cat domestic work, but then, of course, a lot of the natural wild animals and, and uh, various fauna throughout the world in the wild. Um, but there's some things that are pretty conservative across the field. And that is something to do with the skin. Signs of skin irritation and uh, the causes of skin irritation. So the signs of skin irritation that we're normally uh, mostly looking at are redness, dry skin, flaky skin, uh, fur coming out, and sometimes uh, pimples, comedones. And so, um, these are things that I worry about. I'm like, okay, there's something going on. And usually when we're looking at dogs and cats, there's a top three. There's a top three of why most of the animals, in my experience, are usually going to be itchy or have these symptoms. And I'm sure you feel the same way, Dr. Goody. And for me, it's diet, it's environment, and it's ectoparasites, like fleas or ticks. So usually it's fleas. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, especially the, the chronic ear infections, when the skin doesn't look so bad, I'm always going to look at diet for that uh, because I would say 90% of the dogs uh, with, and cats with some sort of a food intolerance uh, or food allergy were going to have chronic ear problems. Uh, this time of year, it's really interesting. People really tend to think that fleas are a summer problem. Right. But they're not. They're actually a fall problem. We're having a bigger problem with fleas now than we did back in June and July. Fleas need a certain amount of humidity in order for their, um, their reproductive cycle to be shortened. And when it gets really hot and dry, which we didn't have as much of that this summer, but if you get a really hot uh, drought time, the flea population will actually die off. But then fall comes along, the moisture comes along, and the temperature starts to drop. And so fleas are attracted by warmth and motion. So when it starts to get cold outside and your dog walks by or the squirrel or the bunny or the cat or the mouse, 
those fleas, I mean, they're leaping 20 feet to get on board and get where it's warm and where there's a good meal and where they can stay alive. So we really, as the temperature drops, we're going to see more activity. We see the same thing with ticks. Here in New Jersey, we have ticks 12 months out of the year. However, there's two times of the year when they are incredibly active, and that's during the seasonal change from fall to winter and then from winter to spring. So it's usually October, November, and then March, April, where we are. Now that's gonna change a little bit depending on where you live, but we, we find that we have the natural, like the kin and kind flea and tick spray and shampoo flying out of our store those two times of the year. So right now, the flea and tick spray and shampoo are extremely popular. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because, um, you know, one just uh, anecdote, uh, a, t a little tidbit of fact is um, just to build upon your your, your flea thing uh, is that's why fleas are very common in prairie dogs in their prairie holes in the prairies. So, and that's where we get plague from, interestingly enough. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I get questioned about a lot is what flea and tick product I should be using on my dogs, on your dogs. Um, is it Prevecto? Is it Furlong? Is it uh, all of the different stuff out there? But the reality is here is that the fleas are, are, can become um, resistant to all of these different products. And there's topical products, there's oral products, there's some that get ticks, there's some that get fleas, there's some that get mites, and they're just all over the place. And it's very hard, and they're exceptionally expensive. Um, and so what I've actually started doing, I started with my family's pets because I, I wanted to ensure that things were working for me that I was comfortable with, uh, was using the Kingkind product. And largely because, number one, it smelled really good to me, and I really wanted to try it. But number two, it's natural. It wasn't all of these different things that we were just tossing at the animals um, that uh, was just going to become resistant another day. And so we tried it. And believe it or not, this was the one thing that was consistent across the board for the different sizes of dogs and the different places that we were going. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're in the height of flea season right now where we are. Um, and, you know, I get people who are saying, oh, I've tried this, I've tried, you know, I've tried this natural product, I've tried that natural product, nothing is working, nothing is working. And I think one of the things that people really have to understand is that spraying your pet every day and only focusing on the pet, you're going to make the pet more comfortable, but you're not solving the problem. The environment is the problem. 95% of the life cycle of the flea is spent off of the pet. So we have to treat the environment as well, whether that's vacuuming, whether that's using powder, you know, a, a natural powder or a natural spray, you've got to treat the yard. And so for people with big yards, I say, well, look, let's just make a 50 foot uh, zone all the way around your house where you're going to treat that, whether that's with beneficial nematodes, diatomaceous earth, uh, you know, a, 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 a yard spray that's a essential oil spray, basically. Uh, there's a lot of ways. My sister lives in Massachusetts, huge tick problem. And so she yeah. had somebody come in and spray cedar oil in her yard and it worked really well. It just doesn't last really long and you have to keep repeating it. And it's not that cheap, but her tick problem is so bad that it's totally worth it. And then she uses the, you know, the kin and kind on the dog. So we've got to remember that it's not just about uh, loading up your poor pet all the time. And people who follow my page know how angry I get about all of those oral flea and tick medications and how dangerous they are for our pets and uh, the tens of thousands of adverse reactions and deaths that we've had. So we really, really want to avoid those. Um, and one of the things, and I know that anybody who follows me has heard me say this before, but it's something that I learned from Janine at Kin and Kind. And it's one of the coolest little facts that I ever got which is that when you use essential oils on your pet, if you have a flea problem, you want to put the shampoo on the dry dog so that the shampoo action, and the oils actually come in contact with the flea. If you wet the dog down first, the flea has a little water bubble around it and water repels oil. So the essential oils don't do near the job killing the fleas because the fleas have this little bubble protecting them. This is one of the coolest things I ever learned. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's not something a lot of people know. 
Uh, no. and thing, when I started, I did not know that either. Because um, <laughs> and and when I did that, I, I would just blame the product. They're like, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's just not as good. It's a right. you know bootleg product. But when I changed the method of treating, you're right. It changed everything. And yep. then it's the best product, honestly. So, <laughs> yep. Um, yep. What, what would you say about um, ticks? You know, there's uh, you, you live in South Jersey, and a lot of your clients live all over the world uh, or country, rather. But um, you know, I live in New York City, and uh, there's parks everywhere. But some people will say there's no ticks here. So why do I have to worry about doing uh, worry about tick control? And not only that, I, I live in just city parks, and so there's no fleas. I don't see any fleas. What would you say to that? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Rats carry fleas. Uh, the cities have rats. <laughs> so, and if you have, if you live in an apartment complex where there are a lot of pets, I mean, maybe the, a lot of apartment complexes are exterminating all the time, and unfortunately, are using chemicals that maybe we don't really want our pets exposed to. Uh, but I have clients who live in apartment complexes, and they're some of the people who have the worst flea problems because somebody mm -hmm. else in the apartment complex has fleas. Their dogs are walking up and down the hall to go in and out, and it, it can be overwhelming. So sometimes it's very difficult for people to control. So, you know, you don't have to live in the country to have a flea and tick problem. Uh, we actually control our ticks really well by having chickens in our backyard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it works really well. That's so great. I keep telling people, just get some chickens. <laughs> yeah. I was advising my friend the same thing. Like, it's a wonderful natural way to treat ticks. <laughs> or it, is. it doesn't work as well for the fleas because we're actually fighting fleas at our house right now. Oh, wow. Um, and so... We've, we've discovered that our underlying, pro well, two underlying problems, my cats go outside mm -hmm. and uh, bunnies and squirrels carry fleas. Bunnies and squirrels are just loaded with fleas. And actually our squirrels, we think all had sarcoptic mange this year because they were all tailless at mm -hmm. the beginning of the spring. We had all these, they look like big rats, all these squirrels. And then over the course of the season, their tails have come in, but they're all white. So now we have squirrels wow. with these bushy white tails uh, and it's just because it damaged the hair mm -hmm. follicles. But the problem is our cats are going outside and what are our cats being exposed to? They're being exposed to the mites that those squirrels have. They're being exposed to the fleas that those squirrel have. And then the cats want to bring all that inside and then our dogs suffer from that. So, yeah. uh, you know, it is kind of a vicious cycle and you have to make sure that you're looking at all the animals. I get people that say, well, I found fleas on this dog. So I'm treating this dog. Well, you can't just apply something to one dog. Remember, 95% of the time, those fleas are in the environment. They're not on the pet. And if you're finding it on one pet in the household, I guarantee you that all of your pets need to have treatment yeah. done. You know, um, it's. I want to touch upon something that you mentioned there. Uh, you thought that your squirrels had sarcoptic mange. And uh, mange or mites, sarcoptic mites, demodectic mites, ear mites, these are another parasite that lives on the body um, and that can cause problems that can cause severe itching sarcoptic oh, yeah. is a severe severe problem and you can get it anywhere uh, all over the world demodectic mange they have it naturally in their skin we have it it's in our eyebrows so lovely but when uh we're where our immune systems are down uh, that also can cause severe itching and, and hair loss and and a lot of the signs of uh, inflammatory skin disease so yeah, it's, it's great that you mentioned it. As, and as, of course, you might. <laughs> well, interestingly, uh, four years ago, we had sarcoptic mange in our house. And at the time, we had 10 dogs and four cats. Wow. It was a bit of a nightmare. And it took me, so it started in my mom's dog, and they were living in a separate house at the time. And we once we finally figured out, because sarcoptes can be very hard to track down. Mm -hmm. So I kept doing my, you know, my cytologies and my tape preps and my skin scrapings, and I wasn't finding anything. So we sa said that my mom's dog had suddenly developed allergies, which at the time the dog was like 12 years old. And I said, well, you know, dogs don't really do that, but we couldn't find it. Then one of our dogs, we moved in together and one of our dogs started to itch. And then the next thing, you know, we had 10 itchy dogs and I finally found mm -hmm. a mite on one of our dogs, but we had already been battling it. I had allergy tested the dogs. I had, you know, bathed, I had tried, tried all these things. And when we finally found the mites, it was like, oh, well now we can solve the problem. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to solve, especially when you have that many animals involved. 
<laughs> but thankfully, you're a veterinarian and are able to find these mites. I don't think that the average owner can find any of these mites, right? No, no. and frankly, uh, a lot of people who uh, will message me or email me or I'll do a consultation and they'll say, you know, my 10 year old dog is suddenly, I mean, it's score of 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Can't stop itching. They've tried Apoquil, they've tried Cytopoint, they've tried steroids and nothing is working. Guess what guys, it's not an allergy. If you're giving all those immunosuppressants and the dog's getting worse, it's not an allergy, it's probably mites. And so you have to approach this from a, from a different direction. Right. Um, so yeah, it, the mites are often, often overlooked. Because um, right. they can be hard to find. That's when these natural products are good uh, for, for prevention but um, eventually, if these things persist beyond the beyond the natural product use, this is time to go see your vet, right? Sure, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, do you yeah. want to talk about uh, in, uh, environmental allergens while we're yeah. talking about itchy? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, believe it or not, as I, I uh, working with domestic animals and then working with wild animals, it's um, you know a little interesting because uh, when I work with the wild animals, I rarely see environmental allergens unless the animal is inbred, like a bottleneck, say a cheetah, where the population has uh, collapsed, or even giant pandas, um, where there's very few uh, animals to breed. But same thing with dogs uh, and cats. Dogs, a lot of them are inbred from, from they all stem from one or two uh, parents, maybe 120, 30 years ago. And so they carry a lot of um, um, allergies with them. And so they might be allergic to various things in the environment or various things in your food. But uh, two things here coming up is we're here up in the Northeast, but a lot of you guys are all over the planet. Um, but it doesn't matter where you are. There, if there are environmental changes, seasonal changes, there's going to be a change in environmental allergens that your dog might be allergic to. And so sometimes your dog or cat might be allergic to things in the winter. Other times, they might be allergic to things in the spring or the summer or, or the fall. So um, whenever you, you have a, a parent with seasonal change, you're gonna probably going to get some sort of environmental allergen um, that's causing your dog to become itchy. Yeah. Well, we do, we do a lot of the uh, serum allergy testing. And uh, the, the company that we're using right now does 48 environmental allergens in their panel. And so the, the first section, we get grasses. And then we have trees and then we have molds and then we have weeds and then we have indoor things like the fleas or carpet fibers, uh, cotton, you know, different things like that. And it's it's really interesting how many of these animals who are genetically predisposed to having allergies. So the, the way you find that out is if you got them from a breeder, you go back to the breeder and go, hey, any of the others in the litter having a problem? Hey, did either of the parents have a problem? And Unfortunately, sadly, a lot of times you'll find out, oh yeah, there's a long line of allergies in this family of dogs and congratulations, you just bought into it. <laughs> but when we look at these tests, it's like, okay, we've got all these grasses, guess what? All summer long, you're gonna have an itchy dog. Oh, we've mm -hmm. got these trees that are blooming and pollinating everywhere in the spring. Well, there's your spring allergies. Oh, we have all these molds. Well, as soon as it gets wet and all the molds start, you've got all the damp leaves on the ground and all the molds. So these animals can go from season to season to season being itchy, itchy, itchy. And you just kind of start to come down off of this season and then the next thing hits. Right. So they can be itchy in multiple seasons. Our goal with our natural therapies is to bring that down as much as possible. And a lot of it, so the interesting thing with allergies for us, so we go outside, we see all that pollen that's coating our cars. And what do we get? We get the watery eyes, the runny nose, and that's our body. The, the, the reason that happens is your body is trying to rinse all the pollen out. So it makes all this drippy moisture to wash your eyes, to wash your nose, to get it back out of your respiratory tract. So it's a defense mechanism that our body does. Interestingly, for our dogs, they go out, they sniff all that stuff in, and their skin breaks out. And thank God our skin doesn't do that because I would have been a disaster 20 years ago when I had so many allergies. But desensitization worked really well for me. It works really well for a lot of our pets. Uh, but a lot of it for these guys is just mechanically removing the irritants. So if you have a pet who you know has seasonal allergens, 
When you bring them in from outside, just take a damp rag, wipe them off, clean in between their toes, wipe their paws, wipe their face, get as much of that mechanical irritant off as you can. And guess what, guys? If you have pets that have these allergies, you can't open your windows in the spring and invite all that pollen in. You just, you just can't do it. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and you also cannot hang sheets and bedding and your dog beds if you're washing them and it's a nice, beautiful spring day. And you're like, oh, let me hang things out on the line. It'll smell, you know, springtime fresh. Well, now it's covered with pollen. <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's an interesting thing. Um, it's a pain in the butt thing a little bit with uh, certain breeds of dogs that we know are prone to these allergies and, and then just your individuals that get it. Um, I think that uh, when I see patients come in with these allergies, it's, it's actually quite difficult just for the veterinarian because it winds up becoming a big chase to understand what exactly it is that is causing your dog or your cat to show these symptoms of itchy skin. Um, First, we have to treat the secondary infections that might ensue, and that takes a while. And even if we're treating the secondary infections, we still have the allergy that they're being exposed to. So when they go home, they're constantly um, itching themselves. And so we're just never getting there. We're never actually uh, taking care of the inciting cause. And so if we take things proactively here before we have to get to the veterinarian, um, you're able to really do well with uh, with uh, preventing them from getting itchy in the first place. Yep. So do you want to take some questions by any chance? Sure. Uh, dog's paws smell like Doritos. Well, there's your yeast. <laughs> <laughs> Corn chips. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are we, uh, let's see. Dog that uh, has environmental allergies, receives immunotherapy, takes Zyrtec, and paws still itch during bad times of the year. Wipe the paws with baby wipes. Uh, it, I lost it. Uh, found that bathing exacerbates the problem. Uh, so it depends what you're bathing with. Uh, we do have some pets who will react to certain things in certain shampoos. Uh, and that's one of the things I, I like about the Kid and Kind line. I have some dogs that are allergic to some of the, uh, the oils in one shampoo, so we can move over to another one. And there's also the puppy shampoo, which doesn't have any scents or anything in it. So it's pretty hypoallergenic. I don't even know if it's still called puppy. Um, but that is a really nice one uh, for just general bathing and getting things off. There's, uh, we, we use all kinds of things. I use a lot of herbals. Uh, I use Chinese herbals. There's one called, um, and it's a, it's a proprietary brand, so I don't think it's available uh, just on Amazon or anything, but we have external wind and great wind keeper. Uh, and so for a lot of my patients that we know, we've tested them, we've had a couple years with them, we know that come June, they're gonna start itching. So we will actually change their diet and start them on an herbal formula mm -hmm. a couple of weeks before when we know they're going to break out so that we are ahead of the curve. It's, uh, if you're trying to put out the fire after the fire already started, it's a lot harder than preventing the fire in mm -hmm. the first place. <laughs> So again, good gut health with, um, you know, a nice, clean, healthy diet. For those of you who use the, uh, the Chinese uh, food, Chinese medicine food therapy, you know that we're going to go for our cooling proteins, our cooling herbs. We're going to calm everything down before we get into that season. Uh, I'm a big fan of allergy desensitization, and they've made it simple now with we can use uh, just oral drops every day. Uh, and we have really good success with it. I have some clients who don't want to do it, but boy, I'd rather do something like that than be giving uh, immunosuppressive drugs. I, I, I'm yeah. really against that. Absolutely. Hey, Judy, um, Dr. Judy, uh, before we move on, since we're at about a half hour now, I was wondering if we can go ahead and uh, post our, our uh, future courses sign up because uh, we have some courses that we're going to be expanding out to with Kin and Kind, including nutrition, supplements, ear infections, essential oils and pets and CBD, actually. Um, and then uh, we can continue to answer a few more questions for- uh, Okay. Yeah. I, I think I just got it posted on there. And Ruth Ackerman, yeah. who's one of my uh, supporters, uh, said that Great Wind Keeper is on Amazon, the Plum Flower brand, and I love it. It works really well. Um, okay, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Best plan of attack for flea tick mosquito repellent for tracking and hunting dogs. 
I would definitely use the kid and kind flea and tick spray before you go out in the field. That stuff is great. <laughs> so, so I'll tell a story that I've told before on my, my page, but, uh, oh man, six, seven years ago, I was invited to be the featured speaker at the national pointer specialty out in Ohio. And so I, I talked for a couple of hours with, you know, had a bunch of natural products and things with me and talked about the importance of diet and, and treating things more naturally and uh, really targeted it towards some of the genetic problems of pointers. But on the second day of the show, they had to go out and do their field trial. So that we were in Ohio and they're out in these farm fields in Ohio and they, you know, they have to go out and find birds and stand the birds and all that stuff. So, you know, a couple hundred dogs and their owners head out to the field in the morning and, you know, we wave goodbye and watch them all go. And one of my clients was there. She was the one who had gotten the event for me. And, um, she used a natural essential oil flea and tick repellent that was made for dogs on her dogs and on herself. And at the oh. end of the day, and of course everybody else is applying all their drops and all their other stuff that they all use. And at the end of the day, the only one who came in tick free was, was my client and her dog. And of course the next day, everybody wanted the essential oil. But what <laughs> people don't understand, and I actually had a client that I said this to yesterday, they think that when you apply a topical, it actually repels. Hmm. Most of them, 99% of them do not repel. They only kill the fleas and ticks after they get on your pet. Whereas essential oils do a much better job of actually repelling. The right. fleas and ticks are like, yeah, I'm not jumping on there. That, you know, yeah. that's not where I want to be. Our friend uh, the same thing, only uses the kin and kind product and doesn't have a dog. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, we, uh, our house right now has a wooded section on one side right by our back patio. So the mosquitoes are a little crazy. And I take my <laughs> kid and kind out there and we spray ourselves as well as the dogs uh, because it's the, the most wonderful repellent and I don't mind the smell. Um, and it's, mm -hmm. it's funny if, when people ask me which uh, essential oil product to use for flea and tick, uh, treatment or repelling action. I'm like the one that you like the smell of, because if you like, I have one client, she douses her animals in cedar oil yeah. and it's a great repellent and her dogs smell like a cedar closet. Every time yeah. they come in, I don't mind it at all. I have other people who say, Oh my gosh, I hate the smell of cedar. I can't possibly do that. So right. it has to be one that you can live with. <laughs> you know, I have some, um, Instagram questions that actually came through. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll know. Um, you know something, uh, uh, I've reviewed a lot of the supplements uh, um, and products that King Kind have for toxicity concerns. Um, but what have you, your thoughts on using any of these kinds of natural products on puppies and kittens? Well, you definitely, if you're going to use a natural product, you've got to uh, read the label. And if it doesn't say on the label, mm -hmm. then you need to call the company or contact them before putting something on a six or eight week old puppy. Right. Most natural products are going to be safer than a lot of the chemicals. The chemical products are absolutely going to say on there, do not use on animals under eight weeks of age or under 10 weeks of age. Right. Uh, and the other thing is whatever natural product you're using, if you're using it on cats or rabbits or guinea pigs, hamsters, believe it or not, those guys can get fleas too. You get fleas in your house, your pocket pets can also have issues. Make sure that you check with the company because most companies are not going to label for the pocket pets and the rabbits. Mm -hmm. um, and we used to say that if it was safe for a cat, then more than likely it would be safe for a rabbit. But mm -hmm. that's not always the case. Right. And so I have been known to email Janine and say, hey, Janine, this particular product of yours, can that be used on a rabbit? Could that be used on a chinchilla? Because you need to ask. You don't. You do not want to be the person who's guilty of poisoning your pet. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Always ask and read the label carefully. We get more cats poisoned that we see every, every year. More cats get yeah. poisoned by the use of dog products on cats. Cats are not small dogs. They are a totally different beast. Yeah, the the kin and kind products. Um, all of them are actually quite safe for uh, yeah. older than eight weeks old. Uh, but all of them are labeled specifically for dogs versus cats or both. So that's something that people should be careful of. 
um, and know that you know we're looking out for your pets and we don't want any accidental exposure to the wrong product that is bad for your animals. And you know this is something that you should take attention, pay attention to rather when you have dogs and cats at home. Exactly. Uh, somebody, somebody said, does anyone know what she's talking about and where to get it? So the kin and, we're talking about kin and kind products. They make a wonderful line of uh, supplements, uh, essential oil, shampoos, flea and tick spray, flea and tick shampoo. Uh, they've got a whole new line of CBD products uh, for topical use. Uh, most of their products are on my website, drjudymorgan.com. Uh, and the products that I don't have, you can find on their website, which is uh, kinandkind.com. So, and, uh, and uh, feel free. Uh, uh, Dr. Judy will have pinned our our future classes for you to sign up to, and then you can learn more about all of the rest of the products that we have available for your pets. Exactly. Your products. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. I'll have to go back. It's it's on there a couple of times, but I'll have to uh, go back and pin it to the top when we're done. Uh, one thing I, I wanted to ask that was on the Instagram questions. Um, firstly, I just did want to say, because someone did ask if, if this is going to be able to be replayed. Uh, yes. I believe yes. And then also um, tear stains. <laughs> What do you use for tear stains? <laughs> Bane of my existence. Uh, so for for me, uh, we can usually take care of tear stains by getting a diet correct for the mm -hmm. animal. Tear stains are bacteria in the tears, and the tears are overflowing, and the bacteria it, bacteria is actually what is causing the staining. So there are products on the market that are um, either drops or powders or feed throughs that are actually you're giving your you're applying antibiotics, and I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, a lot of times, a good probiotic will solve the problem. Uh, but I'll, it's it's really interesting. Uh, some people will say if they add golden paste or a, a turmeric product, sometimes that'll take care of it. It's different for, for every animal. But what I find is if we're getting a lot of tear staining, first of all, we have to make sure that there's no problem with the eyes that's causing an overflow of the tears. So like blocked tear ducts or uh, extra eyelashes that are turning in and rubbing on the eyes. So first of all, we have to make sure that there's not a mechanical problem that's causing an issue there, but then to cause excess tearing. And if that's been ruled out and we're just getting staining, it's it really is a bacterial problem. So I don't like to go to an antibiotic. I really like to straighten out the diet and uh, figure out which supplement is going to help that animal. Yeah. And um, if you if you have a, a different answer to that, I'm I'm all ears because no, I'm no, always no, looking no. for things. I think that's it's great. That's absolutely wonderful. And um, you know, it's 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 a pain of a lot of people's existence actually because they have a lot of little white dog bichons and whatnot that have. Uh, tear staining and usually they're just wiping it, wiping it, but diet changes and whatnot and shampooing cleans it off. Um, one thing uh, that uh, people ask a lot of, especially I have this boxer coming up, so I'm gonna be uh, looking at trying to take care of as well, is um, animals with folds. You know, uh, they smell, they get dirty. Uh, and so for me, uh, what I like to advise people to do is um, get those folds dry, you know? It's the moisture that is locked up inside those folds, which is causing your pet to smell. And so like basset hounds, bulldogs, boxers, it, those folds trap a lot of moisture inside. And that moisture is a perfect place for bacterial growth, but more, most especially yeast growth. Yep, and just the like the ears. <laughs> yeah, just the same thing. And so, uh, routine shampooing, but then drying it off thereafter, ensuring that in between those folds is very dry. The products that Kin and Kind have are very good. They have some drying agents, they have some antifungal agents in them. The tea tree oil is in some of the shampoos. They're fantastic, fantastic products, and they're natural. Um, there's a lot of different products that are out there, but rarely do I see a synthetic product that specifically might target some of these yeast problems. I don't know about you, Dr. Judy, but, well, um, I'm yeah. just not a huge fan of synthetics. I don't want to see sulfates in my shampoos mm -hmm. and I don't like all the detergents. You know, some people complain that an essential oil shampoo, because it doesn't have the detergents, if it's a good natural shampoo, doesn't make a nice foam and lather. Well, you know, mm -hmm. 
the, the lather doesn't do anything. It just makes us feel like we're, we're doing something. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say on that, the topic of the folds, the, I, I had an office manager for a while who did a lot of bulldog rescue. So suddenly I had a million bulldogs coming through the practice and I have to say that I never really thought that much about the bulldog fold problem, those skin folds. What a nightmare. What oh an, and people get these dogs and they have no idea that they have to keep those folds clean. And these right. dogs come in smelling and they have horrible infections. Uh, but one of the best things you can do with those fold problems is don't let your pet get obese because mm -hmm. when they're obese, the folds get deeper. Yes. <laughs> and you can't get in there and they're painful. They're really, yeah. once they're infected, they're painful. Mm -hmm. So keep your pets at a good, healthy weight. That's, that's, and keep them well groomed and clean so that you're not getting that bacterial and yeast build up down in there. The other uh, thing that's also important to remember is that you might have these foldy animals, like a French bulldog that will get these infections, these yeast infections and these, and these wrinkles. But not only that, they could also have allergies. They could also have a food allergy. They could have an environmental allergy and they could have fleas. So, you know, um, it's important to be able to use these products. Uh, sometimes you'll have to use them together uh, because some of them are gonna have chronic allergies and others are, are you're gonna go out into the wild or go on nature hikes and you're gonna have to use the, the parasite protections. So um, a lot of these products are wonderful natural ways to ensure that you're not dumping a ton of medicine on your pet while also providing them with the proper protection and um, allow them to be safe and comfortable at home. Yep. Uh, Allie Coulter says, what are your thoughts on Apoquel? I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> uh, I think I have one dog in my practice that takes Apoquel. Uh, and that was at the owner's insistence and me saying your dog will get cancer. So, uh, yeah, uh, especially this dog that she's asking about has liver and or pancreas problems. Yeah, I, I would be uh, very, very hesitant to, to do that. Um, <laughs> Joyce Rath says no Apoquel. She hates it. So Joyce is a client. She drives up from Virginia to New Jersey to come to my practice with her poor little Susie, who is the sweetest little white dog, uh, who spent three years, I think it was three years, on Apoquel and Cytopoint and didn't stop the itching at all. This poor little dog, she lost her hair. Uh, mm -hmm. she, she lives in um, a Lycra bodysuit and socks so that she can't rip herself apart. Uh, sweetest dog. And Joyce is one of the, the most um, diligent owners in the world. And she works very, very hard at keeping Susie comfortable. So I, I, I applaud her for that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, unfortunately we're thinking, you know, we are fighting three years of kind of, going down the, the wrong path and it can take a really long time and we may we may yeah. never solve the allergy problems it's, like we said it's a genetic issue um and we're trying to control it as best we can and keep the dog as comfortable as possible and uh somebody said the, a good idea in here uh sonia says i take my own shampoo to the groomers i have a variety of kin and kind and we just see what we need that day wow that's very, very good. I'm very impressed with that. Yeah, I have a lot of clients who do that. They, they take their own bottle of shampoo with them. Wonderful. Particularly if you have a pet who has any allergies or tends to break out. or it's, it's amazing how many dogs come back from the groomer and now we've got an itchy rash or a pyoderma uh, with pustules because they broke out in hives from a shampoo that had detergents and sulfates and things in it or a bunch of perfumes. So uh, it's not a bad idea to take your own. Hmm. Judy, Dr. Judy, I have really enjoyed speaking with you today. Uh, it's my first time being able to join you and it's not my last time being able to <laughs> visit your shows. I really, really enjoy it. So I do hope that you can join us actually on our, our future courses that we're going to be offering. And always your comments would be wonderful. Um, <laughs> to let us know how we're doing um, because we share a lot of the same um, thought processes on how to treat pets naturally and uh, holistically for that matter. And um, you know, then I'll have you out to the wild with me and we can go treat some 
wild animals the natural way as well. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, thanks for pinning the live stream. Or, thanks for pinning things uh, for our future classes for people to sign up for Kin and Kind. And uh, I appreciate all of your time. Thank you. It looks like our future courses are going to be nutrition and supplements, ear infections, essential oils, and CBD. So we got all kinds of good stuff coming down the pike. So you can sign up. Uh, I'll pin that link to the top and you can sign up on there. Uh, Hugh, you can cue us some music. And uh, Mark, it's been fun. <laughs> Yes, definitely. <laughs>